While the concept of mechanically extracting pilots from crashing airplanes was proposed as early as 1916, it wasn't until the end of World War II that functional ejection seats began to be featured in operational aircraft. Germany led the way with seats in the Heinkel HE-219 and HE-162, while Sweden had their own version used in the Saab 21. After the war, other nations followed suit, and ejection seats quickly became standard issue for most new fighter aircraft. But due to technical limitations, operational and budget requirements, or just an increased focus on safety, not every escape system was able to make use of what you would call a typical ejection sequence. This is a list of some of the most unusual ejection and bailout methods that have ever been developed. While the introduction of jet aircraft was what created the growing need for reliable ejection systems, the resulting speed increase was also what ended up making early ejection seats incompatible with some airframes. The first seats were propelled by explosive charges similar to shotgun shells which had enough force to get a pilot out of the cockpit, but often not to a height that would clear the rear of the aircraft. One example of this is the F-104 Starfighter. The T-tail on this supersonic fighter was of particular concern during ejection, which engineers decided to solve by just going the other way. Yes, early versions of the F-104 featured a downward firing ejection seat, which was great for leaving the plane in a hurry, but not so great if you were already close to the ground. The Soviet Tu-22 bomber was another plane that required downward firing seats due to the two large engines mounted on the tail. These had a minimum height requirement of 1,000 feet, any lower than that, and your seat would just make sure you were both dead and buried. Due to a large number of fatal landing accidents, crews nicknamed this aircraft the Maneater. While the introduction of rocket-propelled seats solved the tail strike problems, for some planes, it was actually crew orientation that necessitated the use of alternate ejection methods. The B-47's navigator bombarder position was located in the nose of the aircraft. So while the pilot and co-pilot would eject upwards, the only way for the third crew member to go was down. Today, there is only one remaining operational jet that still uses a downward ejection system. With six ejection seats, the B-52 Stratofortress has the most of any other aircraft. And due to its two-story cockpit configuration, two of the six main crew stations are equipped with downward firing ejection seats. Now, just because ejection seats became more readily available after World War II, doesn't mean every single new plane design was actually equipped with them. The Soviet swept-wing Tu-95 long-range bomber was put into service in the early 1950s. It had a top speed of 550 miles per hour, a service ceiling of 38,000 feet, a crew of six, and no ejection seats. But that doesn't mean Russian engineers didn't take into account the challenge of multiple people trying to bail out of a large aircraft. With the understanding that the movement of a damaged or crashing plane can make physically reaching an exit almost impossible, the Tu-95 was equipped with a helpful feature, an evacuation conveyor belt. To exit the bomber, you just pull the emergency lever that jettisons the escape hatch, unbuckle your harness, roll out of your seat onto the now moving floor, grab onto one of the wooden slats on the conveyor, and ride your way out of the aircraft. And if you think only Russia would treat their air crews like a piece of luggage, I'm here to assure you that there is at least one instance where the Americans didn't do much better. Developed for the US Navy in the early 50s, the Douglas A3 Sky Warrior had its ejection seats removed early in the design process. It said this decision was based on the fact that no suitable system was available that could handle all three occupants in such close quarters. But the reasoning also came down to weight. At 70,000 pounds, this plane was the heaviest aircraft to ever operate from a carrier. Some lovingly called it the Whale, which is a refreshing change as I find most nicknames seem to refer to a particular plane's tendency to crash or kill its crew. In place of ejection seats, Douglas did provide Whale air crews with a well-engineered and reliable escape system, also known as a slide. Who knew that all that time as a kid at the playground was actually preparing you to one day bail out of a military aircraft. Pulling a handle in the cockpit will pneumatically blow out the inner and outer doors in the floor, forming a continuous chute. Each crewman would then have to maneuver out of their seat and jump feet first down the slide. Understandably, this escape system was pretty much useless at low altitude, making launch and traps on the carrier an even more hazardous operation. If something went wrong, you were forced to ride the plane in and hope all three occupants could get out the overhead hatch 
before the 70,000 pound plane sank below the waves. Thus, the A3D earned itself another nickname, All Three Dead. See, I told you, aircraft nicknames, they're always so morbid. As ejection seat technology improved, there were requests from the Navy to retrofit the Sky Warrior with a more reliable escape system. But surprisingly, no changes were ever made, and the emergency slide remained in place until the plane's retirement in 1991. The B-58 Hustler was the U.S. Air Force's first operational supersonic bomber, capable of achieving speeds up to Mach 2 with a service ceiling of 70,000 feet. And I probably don't have to tell you that ejecting in such conditions would most likely be fatal. To overcome this unique challenge, a company called Stanley Aviation pioneered the fully enclosed individual escape capsule. By pulling a lever, the shoulder straps are tightened, legs are restrained, and an airtight shell is closed around the crew member and seat. On ejection, a drogue chute is used to stabilize and slow the capsule, at which point the main recovery parachute is deployed. A deceleration bag cushions the landings on hard surfaces, while outrigger booms and additional airbags keep the seat upright and afloat in water landings. Additionally, survival supplies and 72 hours worth of food were included to sustain the crew member until he could be rescued. While it would also be used in the XB-70 prototype, the B-58 remains the only production aircraft to feature individual crew escape capsules. But there were a few planes that took the capsule concept a step further. Soviet surface-to-air missile developments in the 1960s put a quick end to the United States' reliance on high-altitude bombers. Thus, the Air Force had new requirements for its next plane, which would need to be both supersonic and operate close to the ground. General Dynamics fulfilled these objectives with a swing-wing fighter plane that was equipped with terrain-following radar. The F-111 was designed to skim the ground at supersonic speeds well below enemy radar systems. But in the event of an emergency, the Air Force also wanted the crew to be able to eject under those same conditions. But this Mach 1 at 100 feet escape requirement wouldn't even be achievable by today's best seats, never mind ones in the 1960s. To overcome this challenge, the entire side-by-side two-man crew compartment was turned into a 3,000 pound detachable capsule. After being separated from the plane with an explosive cord, two rockets take this literal escape pod up and away from the aircraft. Much like the individual capsules in the B-58, the F-111 crew version features deceleration bags for landing and was designed to float in water. Though such a system was proposed for other planes and even the space shuttle, the F-111 was the only production aircraft to ever be equipped with a full crew escape system. The only outlier being three of the cancelled B-1A prototypes, which featured a four-man version. When the B-1 program was restarted in 1982, the B model used regular ejection seats to reduce weight and eliminate the extensive maintenance an escape capsule requires. Our next entry is probably the strangest escape system to ever be put into full production. This tractor rocket method is described as an extraction system rather than an ejection seat, because in this design, the seat doesn't actually leave the aircraft. Instead, a catapult launched rocket is used to pull the pilot out of the cockpit via a tether. Once again, it's Stanley Aviation leading the way in unique egress engineering. They called it the Yankee Extraction System, a fitting name considering the fact that it literally yanks you out of the airplane. Designed to be used in cockpits with limited space for traditional ejection seats, it was implemented in two American warplanes, the Douglas A-1 Sky Raider and the Fairchild AT-28 Nomad. Additionally, Russia employs their own version of the tractor rocket in the KA-50 and KA-52 helicopters, which pulls the pilots out of the cockpit after the rotor blades have been blown free. Despite looking like it is something out of a cartoon or spy movie, the Yankee system proved itself to be reliable, even in 0-0 situations, meaning it could get you clear of the airplane and high enough to open your chute at zero airspeed and zero altitude. After the Challenger disaster in 1986, NASA experimented with a tractor rocket escape system of their own. The space shuttle version required astronauts to lie on their backs one at a time to be launched out the side of the vehicle. Initial testing tore the legs off life-size dummies, and though results eventually improved, in the end, NASA decided it didn't like the idea of carrying rockets inside the space shuttle crew cabin. For our final section, we will look at some crazy bailout methods that were either designed for very specific situations or never made it much past the prototype phase. Like I mentioned earlier, the Challenger explosion really pushed NASA to try and develop some way for the crew to leave an aborted launch. 
even if it would only be usable in very specific conditions. Both the crew capsule and tractor rocket system were considered, but in the end, the answer ended up being a long curved pole. Yes, these rocket scientists basically came up with something slightly better than a slide. It did the job though. Sliding down the telescoping pole on a tether allowed astronauts to exit cleanly and stay clear of the wings and tail of the shuttle. Over the years, there have been a few patents filed for commercial airplane escape systems, including one where each passenger has their own ejection seat, and another where the whole passenger compartment separates and floats to the ground suspended from multiple parachutes. In the early 70s, there were a few proposals for flyable ejection seats, allowing pilots to hopefully get clear of enemy territory and make rescue both easier and safer. And finally, we have this wild mechanical bailout concept from 1944. Before they became a world leader in ejection seat technology, one of Martin Baker's first designs was the swinging arm escape system. While it was never put to the test, the original model of this pilot trebuchet can be found at the Martin Baker offices. If you enjoyed this video, I invite you to subscribe and check out some of my other weird history content linked here. My name is Sledge, thanks for watching.